Boy, it is, uh, it is great to be back here in Israel. It is great to see how much this conference has grown. I still remember when Adi and I uh, first chatted about this at CPPCon many years ago. And this was just an idea. And what a great work, what a great job by all the organizers to not only make this conference happen, but make it into now the second largest C++ conference. So I think that's pretty great. So my name is Bryce edelstein Lobach. Uh, I've been working on programming languages and compilers for over a decade now. I'm the chair of the standard C++ library evolution group, which uh, designs and standardizes the uh, C++ standard library. And I'm a principal architect at NVIDIA, where I drive our strategy for HPC programming models, C++ compilers, and C++ libraries. And I'm going to take questions at the end of this talk, not in the middle of this talk. So C++ 20 was the largest release in over a decade. And it delivered four major features, modules, coroutines, concepts, and ranges, and dozens of other additions and improvements. And now, uh, in 2023, C++ 20 is now widely available, with most implementations shipping pretty much all of it in production. And we're starting to see increasing adoption and more and more projects and organizations switching to C++ 20 as their default. It takes a little, little bit of time after we put the standard out there for uh, it really to uh, get into widespread usage, but we're just now starting to see that. And uh, the next C++ standard, C++ 23, just shipped back in February. And there's a lot of exciting changes coming in C++ 23, to name a few of them. Uh, there's a bunch of enhancements and additions to ranges, um, sort of completing the work that we started in C++ 20. Uh, there's formatted output. Uh, there's MDSpan, a multi-dimensional array abstraction, which is actually the thing that I originally joined the committee eight years ago to get into the standard. Uh, there's expected, which is this uh, new error reporting facility standard library modules, and uh, deducing this. So in the months leading up to a new release of C++, like C++23, our focus often becomes on what makes it into that release and what doesn't. And we tend to put longer term goals um, on the shelf because we're focusing on getting the release out the door. And so today, I want to uh, dust off those longer term goals and take them down off that shelf. I want to look at beyond C20 and 23 and ask the question, what is next for C++? So today, I'm going to tell you about three features that the C++ committee is working on, features that I think will revolutionize how we write C++ code. And those features are reflection, pattern matching, and senders. So our exploration today will focus on what we can do with these facilities, not the specifics of the committee proposals or the merits of different design decisions. This is a talk about possibilities, not about details. Um, much of what I'm going to show you is tentative and in some places speculative. In places where the design is uncertain, I've chosen the option that makes the most sense to me and ignored anybody else's options or opinions. Uh, this talk represents my own views. I do not speak for the committee as a whole. No one really can. All right. So first, let's talk about reflection. And to talk about reflection, we first have to understand metaprogramming, which is inherently tied to reflection. So metaprogramming is the craft of creating or modifying programs as the product of other programs. Reflective metaprogramming is metaprogramming that incorporates data from the program that's being modified. So there's three key components to reflective metaprogramming. The first is reflection, that is having some way to extract information from the program. The second is compile time programming, facilities or tools that allow us to manipulate that information that we've extracted. And then finally, we need a way to do injection, to insert new programming entities based on that information and those compile time computations that we've done. So let's look at a simple example. Um, so this is a function that takes an enumerator and returns uh, its name as a string. And we're using a few new C++ constructs here. So first, we have this new operator. And this is called the reify operator. And it takes a C++ entity uh, that could be a function, a struct, you know, an enumerator, a variable, a namespace. And it produces a reflection um, of that entity. And a reflection is a handle to some internal compiler representation of that thing, in this case, of the type t. Now, 
that reify operation will produce a std meta info object, which is the type for reflection uh, data. And reflections can be manipulated and transformed just like any C++ objects. So here, we pass the reflection of the enum type T to the function meta members of. And meta members of returns another meta info object that represents all of the enumerators of T. So such a meta info object is a range. So we can use a range based for loop to iterate through the elements. Now here we want to use the new compile time expanded for loop template four. So each element may be a different type, which a normal for loop wouldn't allow. And this loop actually happens at compile time. So it just sort of stamps out one different iteration for each of the types um, in this compile time range. So in each iteration of this compile time for loop, we want to check if the enum parameter of the function is equal to the value of the current enumerator. To do that, we need to take the reflection of the current enumerator and turn it back into a real entity. And we can do this with the splice operator. So the splice operator takes a reflection value and turns it back into the entity that that reflection represents. In this case, the enumerator in question. So if the parameter is equal to the current enumerator, then we need to return its name. And we can get that name with another function that operates on reflections, meta name of. And that's it, we're done. All right, so here's another example. Uh, this is hash append, a hash protocol that incrementally passes input to a hash algorithm. So it's gonna take a hasher object and an object to hash. First, we reflect on the object that we're hashing, and we use the members of function to get all of its members. The members of function takes an optional parameter which filters for certain kind of members. In this case, we only want non-static data members. So next, we do a template for loop over all of those data members. And then we use the splice operator to access the data member, and we recursively call hash append on the member. All right, ready for something a little bit more complicated? So we can also presumably inject at class scope, allowing us to build powerful wrappers. So here, this is a, uh, a traced class that's gonna take another type and wrap it, adding a print call before invoking each of the underlying types methods. So traced has a data member of the wrapped object and takes it as a template parameter. And we use a template for at class scope to generate a member for each member function of the wrapped type. This is sort of a D style construct, which is not surprising given that Andre is the one who gave me the code for this slide. So first, to inject the member, we need to inject the protection, attributes, and return type of the member that we're wrapping. And we do that with a bunch of uh, splice operations and uh, functions that operate on meta info uh, objects. Next, we need to name the method that we are injecting. Now, we can't use the regular splice operator because it would inject the method of the underlying type. But what we want is to create a new method in traced with the same name. Think of the regular splice operator as being uh, similar to injecting a pointer to member. Um, we can only use that on an object of the underlying type, not on our wrapped type. So instead, we use the uh, identifier splice, which operates at the lexical level and inserts a name. So now we need to generate the parameters for the method. And here we use splicing pack expansion. So adding triple dots before a splice will cause it to expand to a parameter pack-ish construct, which can then be unpacked with a trailing sequence of triple dots, just as you would with a regular parameter pack, as we do here. A lot of dots, I know. OK, so then we inject the qualifiers of the underlying method. And now we're onto the body of the uh, wrapping method. So first, we're going to just print out the name of the method that we're calling. We could also presumably print out the parameters and other things, but that wouldn't fit on the slide. 
So next, we generate the call to the underlying method on the underlying object that we've stored. And note that here we use the regular splice operator, um, not the identifier splice operator, because we're operating on an object of the type that we're reflecting on. Presumably, we could also use the identifier splice operator, because it would then insert the name, and that is the correct name of the member of the thing. But we don't have to use it here. And then we forward all the parameters. And then we inject the names of the parameters, again using splice pack expansion. And here we have to use the identifier splice because we're referring to the generated parameters of the wrapping method, not the parameters of the underlying method. OK, and with that, we are done. I'll let, you, I'll let that sink in for a moment. All right, but not a moment too long. OK. So reflection can be a powerful tool for automating data layout transformations and optimizations. So one common transformation that can have huge performance impacts is switching between array of structs, where data is stored as a single sequence of multi-component elements, and struct of arrays, where data is stored as one sequence for each separate component. So switching between the two usually requires structural code changes, as shown here. Array of structs is often more intuitive, but structs of arrays usually offers better memory access patterns, which can be critical when parallelizing or vectorizing. Consider this code, which applies an operation to just the red channel of a sequence of colors. It will have a strided access pattern, and in some cases that may have alignment issues that would inhibit vectorization or parallelization. So we can use reflection to write a wrapping type that automates transforming from array of structs to struct of arrays. So first, we need to get the non-static data members of the type that we're wrapping, just as we've done in the last few examples. Then we inject a vector for each data member of the underlying type. Here, we're using the uh, splicing uh, pack expansion that we saw in the, uh, the traced example. Then we have this constructor that will initialize the wrapper from a range of the underlying structs, so from array of structs data. So we use a template for to iterate over each of the component vectors. And then for each component vector, we resize it. And then we copy from the range of array of structs data, just the piece that we need for this particular component. Now, we can make our wrapping struct of arrays type a range of tuples of references to the components. And that way, it can be iterated as if it was an array of uh, structs type. So it would be completely uh, uh, interchangeable with uh, array of structs types. So here, I've just shown how to do that for the index operator. But you could imagine how you would do it for iterators as well. So here, to write the index operator, we use the identifier um, pack splice operator to get a pack to the element in each of the component vectors at the specified index. Uh, and then we use tie to return a tuple of references to those elements. And so you can see how it's a little bit more code, but you can see how you could write iterators um, that use the same basic principle. So now we can take our natural and intuitive array of structs code. And by simply changing just one line of code, we changing the type of image from vector to SOA, we've switched the code from array of structs to struct of arrays. And this changes the memory access pattern for our single channel operation from strided access to contiguous access, which is more cache efficient and easier to vectorize. So I'll show you the code here one more time. So I think that reflection is going to fundamentally change how we write C++ code. Reflection will help us solve problems that today often require boilerplate, macros, or external code generation, like serialization, protocol and language bindings, instrumentation, logging, debugging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's also going to change how we build and design libraries and how we evolve the language itself. A lot of features that we build today as language features, maybe we'll be able to build as library abstractions solely using reflection. So now let's move on to pattern matching. So today, C++ has two types of selection statements. 
It's got switch, which operates on a single integral value, which is often too limited. You can't use them with string literals or with objects. And it's got if statements, on the other hand, which operate on arbitrary Boolean expressions. They're powerful, and it can express almost anything, but they're often too complex and verbose. So what we need is something in between the two, a powerful but concise way to select and then decompose objects. And that's what we get with inspect, which is a new selection statement for C++. It matches values against patterns and binds variables when matches are successful. So inspect is actually an expression, not a statement. An inspect expression takes a parameter, the object to select against, and a series of patterns. And there's a variety of different patterns available, and I'm going to highlight a handful of them today. So each pattern is followed by a statement, which is taken if the pattern matches. Inspect stops at the first match, not the best match. So constant patterns match if the object is equal to the constant. And the wildcard pattern will match against anything. Constant patterns aren't limited to integrals or enums. They can be strings or any arbitrary object. So here's another example. This is Fibonacci written with inspect. So here, we use the identifier pattern, which binds the value to a name. Pattern guards can be used to perform arbitrary tests for a match. Let me leave this here so we can digest it for a moment. So since C++17, we've been able to destructure tuple-like objects. We can do that in inspect too with compound patterns. So this compound pattern consists of three constant patterns. So it will match if the object um, can be destructured into three components, like a tuple, and if each of those components is equal to the corresponding constant. On the other hand, this compound pattern consists of three variable patterns. So it will match anything that can be destructured into three components, regardless of their value. Alternative patterns can match different types in variant or any like objects, or polymorphic objects. They give us a cleaner way to work with variants. So instead of writing a visitor and calling std visit, which is often horrible, uh, we can just inspect the variant and use alternative patterns. We can also use alternatives to match a polymorphic object against different classes. So here we have a circle class and a rectangle class, both of which inherit from shape. And when inspecting a shape, we can use a combination of the alternative pattern and the compound pattern to determine whether the shape is a circle and rectangle, and then decompose it into its defining characteristics um, at the same time. So alternatives can also be useful when working with uh, dependent types in a template, as we're going to see a little bit later. So extractor patterns allow us to completely customize matching and decomposition by implementing our own extractor protocols. So an extractor is an object that has either an extract or try extract method. And when an extractor pattern is used, this method is called with the value under inspection. And then if the result of that call has a value, it is matched against uh, the child pattern. For example, in the first pattern in this inspect, phone number dot try extract will be called. And if it returns a value, that value will be matched against the compound pattern here. So let's look at a more detailed example that combines the power of pattern matching and reflection. So we're going to write a uh, simple function to serialize C++ objects to JSON. So our function will take an object that we want to serialize and return a std string. So first, we need to create the string that will fill with the JSON. Uh, we're going to add an opening brace to it, and then we'll close it at the end of the function after we've filled it with uh, the contents of the object that we're working with. So we'll get a meta info that lists all of the non-static data members, just as we have before. And then we'll iterate through it with a template for. 
So first, we're going to output the name of each member using meta name of. And then we inspect the member to output its value. So if it's a bool, we output either true or false, as those are constants in JSON. And if the member satisfies the numeric concept, then we output it as a number just using the default std format formatting. And if it's a pointer and it's equal to null, then we output null, which is a JSON constant. If it's a non-null pointer, we're just going to print out its address. If it's something convertible to a string, then we will output it in quotes. And if it's a range, we are going to recursively call save JSON on it, uh, on each element of the range. And then we'll use format's default range formatting, which happens to output in the JSON list format. And finally, if the member is something else, we just recursively call save JSON on it. And then we add a comma after the member, unless it's the last member. And finally, after that, um, after we're done for each member, we will add the closing brace, and then we just return the string. And that's it. In just a few lines of code, we've written a powerful and generic serialization function uh, using pattern matching and reflection. Writing this today would probably be a lot more verbose, and it would likely require each type to opt in and provide its own serialization function in some way. But with reflection and pattern matching, we can just do this very cleanly without any opt-in. So inspect gives us a powerful new way to select and decompose objects. It makes working with tuple-like and variant-like objects far more natural in C++. I think it's going to revolutionize how we'll write code day to day. It'll make expressing conditional logic a lot simpler and more natural. All right, finally, let's talk about asynchrony in C++. So today, C++ has no standard model for asynchrony and no standard way to express where things should execute. And that's why we're introducing senders, a model for asynchronous execution in C++. There's three key concepts in the senders model. Schedulers are lightweight, non-owning handles to execution contexts. Schedulers produce senders. Now, senders represent asynchronous work that will eventually send a signal. A signal is either success and a set of values produced by the work, failure and an error produced by the work, or cancellation. Senders can be composed together with sender algorithms to form task graphs. Receivers are connected to senders and process their asynchronous signals. So let's take a look at a simple example. So first, we need to get a scheduler from somewhere, from a thread pool, a tasking system, a GPU driver, etc. To start a chain of work on the scheduler, we call schedule, which returns a sender. And that sender will complete on the execution context associated with the scheduler. Next, we use a sender algorithm, then, to compose work onto the sender that we got from the scheduler. This work will be performed on the same execution context. The sender algorithm will return a new sender, which we can use to add more work onto that chain. Then finally, we wait until the chain of work has completed using sync wait, which will return the value sent by the final sender in the chain. So this pipe syntax gives us a clean way to compose chains of senders in the order that they will be evaluated. So let me show you a few examples. So we've developed a prototype of senders that supports uh, CPU schedulers, GPU schedulers, and distributed schedulers. Um, and by we, I mean NVIDIA. Uh, and so we have this demo of the simple electromagnetic wave simulation that solves Maxwell's equations on a uniform grid. And this is what the entire solver loop uh, looks like. Um, and it's expressed as a graph of senders. So this code can be run with a variety of different schedulers. By changing just one line of code, the kind of scheduler that we pass into the solver, we can go from running inline on a single CPU thread to running in parallel on the CPU using something like OpenMP uh, to a single GPU. 
to multiple GPUs within a single node, and to multiple nodes scaling up to thousands of GPUs. So we've also ported a simulation from the Palabos Fluid Dynamics Framework to senders. Uh, this simulation mar models uh, carbon sequestration techniques. So the porous structure that you see is sandstone that's saturated in salt water. And the red bubbles are liquid CO2, which is injected at the bottom, and it travels upwards through the sandstone because of buoyancy forces. Using a distributed GPU scheduler, we've run this application on up to 512 GPUs. With standard C++ senders, you can change one line of code and scale from a single CPU thread up to an entire cluster of GPUs. I'll let us watch the cool video a little more. So let's look at an example from the networking wor world. So we're going to do an asynchronous read of an array of data of unknown length. So we'll use this dynamic buffer type to store the data that we read in the unique pointer as well as the size. And our async read array function will return a sender which sends a dynamic buffer. And it's going to take a handle to whatever networking library we're working with. So we'll start our sender chain by introducing a new dynamic buff buffer, eh, buffer object with just. Next, we use a let value sender adapter to create a scope that will keep the buffer alive for as long as we need it. And then inside of the let value, we continue building the chain of work. So the first thing that we'll, we need to do is figure out how big the array will be. So we'll expect that whoever is sending us this data will send a size t that contains the size of the rest of the data. And so we'll need to read that size t first. So to do that, we're going to get a, a span that points to that size member of our dynamic buffer object. And that's what we do right here with the span constructor and as writable bytes. So then we'll call async read. Um, a sender adapter that expects a span and reads into it. Async read will send the number of bytes that it actually read. So we're going to add a, a then, uh, which is going to do three things. So first, we need to make sure that we read the number of bytes that we expected, so a size t's worth. Next, we will allocate that many bytes in the unique pointer. And then finally, we will return a span to that storage uh, because we're going to next do an async read into that uh, uh, storage that we just created. So now we're, we'll do the second async read right here that's going to actually read the data. And then after that read, we have a second then, which will confirm that we read the number of bytes that we expected. And with that, we're done. OK, so we're going to look at another example now. Uh, one of my favorite algorithms, a parallel inclusive scan. Um, so we're going to write a generic asynchronous version of this, and we'll write it as a pipeable sender adapter so that it can be composed with other sender algorithms. So it'll take three parameters, a sender, which will expect to send the input as a range, an initial value, and the number of tiles to split the input into. So we're going to use the classic two-path parallel scan approach, which requires temporary storage for partial results communicated between tiles. So we need to allocate the temporary storage asynchronously once the prior sender has sent us the input. So we'll chain a then sender onto the prior sender. In the body of this continuation, we'll create a vector to hold those partial results. And then we'll send both the input range and the vector onto the next thing in the chain. So next, we need to do the first parallel pass, the down sweep. So we're going to use the bulk sender and adapter to invoke the body of the pass for each of the tiles. Bulk is sort of like then, except it does something in parallel. So the first thing that we need to do for each tile is calculate the range of elements that belong to the tile. So then we take all of the elements in each tile, and we perform a local serial inclusive scan on them which we do right here. So next, we need to propagate information between the tiles. So the sum of each tile needs to be added to the elements of all subsequent tiles. 
We've already computed that sum. It's the last element of the local inclusive scan. So we store that result into the partials vector. So assignments to partials from different tiles may happen concurrently, but that's perfectly fine. Each tile uses a different and unique slot in partials, and no one reads from partials yet, so there's no data race here. Then after all of the tiles have completed their local inclusive scans and written to partials, we need to, do one, we need to have one execution agent do a serial inclusive scan of that partials vector. We do this by piping another then sender onto the chain, which will perform the partials uh, inclusive scan. This then sender will again pass along the input sequence and the partials vector. So the result of the scan over partials looks like this. The information that each tile needs to add to its elements is in the partials slot for the tile directly preceding it. Now we need to go parallel again to distribute that information within all tiles. And this is the, called the upsweep pass. So we'll pipe another bulk once again over all tiles. In the body of this bulk, we'll need to calculate which elements belong in the current tile, just as we did in the downsweep pass. Then we use a serial for each to increment each element in the tile by the appropriate value from the partials vector. And after that addition, we'll have the correct result in all elements of the output. So finally, we want the sender returned by our asynchronous inclusive scan to only send the input sequence, not the partials vector, because that was temporary storage. So we add a final then sender, which only passes along the input. The partials vector will be destroyed when this then sender completes. And that's it. We're done. We've got a generic, asynchronous, and parallel inclusive scan that we can run on any scheduler we want running from you know, a single CPU thread up to thousands of GPUs. So reflection, pattern matching, and senders. I believe that these are the three most exciting features that we're working on on the C++ committee right now. And I think combined, they will radically improve how we express ourselves in C++ and allow us to elegantly solve problems that are challenging today. So thank you all for your time and attention. And let's thank everybody who helped me out with this talk on the next slide. Um, come find me later if you uh, have questions, want to get more involved. Uh, I have a podcast. It's called ADSP. It's not particularly good, but it's amusing at times. Um, and I have some time for questions now. Um, so oh, thank you. All right, yeah, there in the front, the third row. Seems that uh, the reflection ID is quite hard to use. So can you speak up a little bit? My hearing's not amazing. Uh, it, it seems that to demonstrate that reflection ID is quite hard to use. For instance, your example of tracing. Yeah, so, tra so traced is an interesting one. Uh, the question was, it, it looks like the reflection thing is hard to use. And you, you, you pointed out traced as an example. So I actually I had a, a funny conversation with my colleague, Sean Baxter, who works on Circle um, a couple weeks ago, where I asked him, hey, in Circle's worldview of reflection, how would you write something like this traced class? And his answer was, don't do that. His answer was, you know, like, I used to think that reflection was like this whole big important thing, and it was going to solve all the world's problems. But, uh, but now I'm not so sure, and, and I think like the, the high value parts of reflection he felt were um, being able to do stuff like the, the serialization or writing like you know, a hash append function or doing like the enum thing where you, get the, you uh, convert the enum to uh, whatever its name is. Um, but reflecting over functions and doing stuff like wrapping methods, he felt like that was too hairy and ugly. Um, and yeah, that one is pretty uh, unpleasant. I think that we might need some sort of higher level facility to be able to just say like, hey, I want to clone this particular method, um, or maybe just a, a way to like clone the entire signature of the method. Um, so yeah, that one is admittedly um, not so pretty. However, I disagree with him that it's not a useful thing to do. Um, I think traced is like a really powerful example, and I think the like structive arrays thing is a really powerful example. And I also, I, I tire of seeing the, the same reflection example of, hey, let's 
have a function that takes an enum and gives, gives it its name, or hey, let's have a function that does some form of serialization. Um, that is not the only thing that reflection is going to be good for. Um, I think it is far more powerful than that, and so I think that those examples uh, demonstrate that. The, all of the syntax that you've seen in, in that part of the talk is all highly speculative. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily going to be substantially like, nicer or cleaner, but I also don't think that that's something that people are going to have to do every day. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, your code misses no except specification of method and requires cloud, so it's uh, not very correct. Um, well, it would pick up the, the idea is that the qualifiers of thing would clone the no except specification. There was, there was a, uh, I could go find the slide. Um, it'll take a little while to get there. Um, but, I mean, the... <laughs> You know, all, 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 of those, all those little functions that clone parts of the signature don't exist today. Yeah, maybe we should turn that off. Um, all those little functions that clone the signature don't, don't exist today, so I can just by fiat say that they do the right thing. Um, and uh, you can't prove me wrong because they don't exist. <laughs> Like, the purpose of the slide is to demonstrate that it does the right thing, not to, uh, like, it's to illustrate the idea. I don't care so much about correctness, but the idea is that qualifiers of would, would, uh, would copy all the stuff that comes after the parameters list. Uh, and, and you know what, if you, have, if you have issues with this particular slide, blame Andre, I just directly stole this code from him. I don't know why he felt like we needed to have three, to, like, a separate thing for protection and for attributes. Uh, for protection, I can get, but for attributes versus return, I would have just made those the same thing. Um, you probably need something more fine-grained than qualifiers of if you want to clone it with a different no-accept specification. Um, I'm just going to claim here that print is something that's no-accept, so it's fine to just, claim, to just clone the no-accept specification. But details like that I'm not particularly concerned about. Uh, right there. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I mean, you know, the pr probably the, the simplest, the thing that could be added as quickly as possible would be solely reflection and no injection facility. You can still do lots of useful stuff just with extracting information and without needing to inject new code entities, and that's like a whole, you know. I, I tried asking the, uh, we're recording this, but whatever. I tried asking the authors of the, uh, the proposal some, some clarifying questions about the splice operator and what exactly it inserts, because one thing that uh, uh, bothers me is um, this right here, this t.member thing. So if, if member splices in a code entity, what code entity is it? Like, is it a pointer to member? Because if it's a pointer to member that it inserts in here, then this t dot syntax is wrong because that's not the syntax for how you apply a pointer to member. It would be t dot star. And so I asked them, like, but isn't this wrong? And they're like, no, like, it's sort of like magic and works. So then if we're, are we making this like a magic thing? Uh, that, 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 um, that, like, what exactly that splices back in, I think, is an interesting question. And we don't really, like, fully have a model for how like, in the, the injection part works yet. Um, I will be interesting to see answers to all those things. Um, you know, we, we do have the Reflection TS, which has a different model for um, uh, representing all this, this uh, 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 information. Um, but we, we definitely have more experience with um, the reflection part, the extracting information part. And that part we could probably ship sooner rather than later. The, the splicing is a, a little bit harder. Uh, yep. Let me, let me, there's a lot of hands, so I'm going to have you go put your hand back into the queue, and then I'm going to come back to you. Um, all right, yeah. Um, how does, how would inspect work with a convertible queue versus same as? Uh, I do not know. I think that that has been a topic of a heated discussion on the committee. There's this whole, uh, been this whole discussion about this is as model for convertibility and, and casting in this. So I think we don't, 
No idea. I think that I think I have no idea. I think the committee has multiple different models. I don't know which particular model I would want, but that is, I think, one of the critical questions here. Um, like in particular, on the example that I showed um, here, uh, let's go to this. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, this one, mm, the one where I was doing the JSON thing. The first pattern in the match was a bool. Um, so what if you're, what if you have like a class type like that's convertible to bool, like an optional? Like does that mean that that matches? Hmm. And then you know you go to the string view one. Well, obviously we want the string view one to match to a string, right? Not just exactly specifically to string view, but we probably want the bool one to only match if it's exactly bool. So yeah, we need a way to be able to distinguish between those two. This particular model that I showed here, which is from like the first, like the third revision of the the, of the pattern matching proposal from Michael Park, doesn't I think have that fully figured out yet? But I hear that there's new developments. So yeah, good question. All right, other hands. Um, Let's see, right there. So the senders seem to work on data as a whole. But for example, in the, in the network receive uh, uh, example, you might want to use to operate in data as it arrives. Um, the, the question is uh, that senders seem to operate on data as a whole, and that in the, the, the network example, you may want to operate on data as it arrives. Well, the that, that was sort of the whole idea between, behind async read, read some number of bytes and then it tells you how many bytes it read. Um, and so it presumably could do partial reads. I don't, think that it's, I don't think that senders necessarily has to operate on data as a whole, it's just like that each one is gonna operate on however much data it has. So I think that op doing like partial reads and doing incremental reads is something that's completely within the realm of what you can do with senders. That, that particular example just showed a particular way to do it and it wasn't graceful to the possibility of the second read being short. It just assumed if the second read was short that it was gonna blow things up. It also just like asserted instead of doing any form of error handling. So that's not, you know, don't ship that code in production. Um, other question right there. Uh, no, I think it's, um, I think, I, I think that if, if you just want to take like, um, purely synchronous code and then make it async, like, that is the nice thing with coroutines that like, you can just sort of take your, your synchronous serial code and then just sort of add the keywords and uh, have it port in the same way. Um, but I don't think that uh, the uh, sender's interface is like, particularly uh, ergonomically unfriendly, I actually think it's uh, a little too ergonomically friendly, which is perhaps one of its, uh, like it's a little too clever in some ways. What I just mostly meant is that the way that you pass variables. Um, yeah, the, the way that, the figuring out how to pass variables through through chain, like doing like the point free style of, of parameter passing. Yeah, if you're not just working on like a single thing, like it, it gets a little bit complicated, but if you're not just working on a single thing, you probably, you maybe don't want to use the pipe syntax, maybe like, just like use a different, use the different syntax. You don't have to use the pipe, pipe syntax for that necessarily. Um, but yeah, like that is a challenge. Um, coroutines, the, uh, the lazy nature of coroutines and a number of other aspects of coroutines makes them uh, not a perfect fit for all types of execution contexts, in particular for like eager execution. And also because it's a compiler, um, uh, thing, the, it's a compiler generated thing. We don't necessarily have, it, 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 like the coroutine handle is quite opaque, which can be challenging with some types of execution context. All right, I'm gonna take a hand in the back, in the very back there, yeah, you. Yeah, okay. you're gonna have to uh, speak loud. Um, yeah, so that, that one works by doing like dynamic cast under the hood. At least that's what it says in the paper. I would, I would presume that that's, that that's how it has to work, yes. All right, other questions? Uh, right there. Yeah. Um, is there gonna be some sort of equivalent for doing metaprogramming with existing algorithms? That's a good question. We may need, I mean, you could just use the existing algorithms that, 
the thing that you the the, the special thing about temp ten point four that we saw is really that it um, is the class scope injection thing. Um, I mean, I think you could use some context for algorithms um, to do some of these things. Um, so yeah, maybe we could add. I don't know. Well, we, we, it's really we need like heterogeneous uh, algorithms that are heterogeneous in type um, and that like operate on tuples. So yeah, I guess we would need a new set of algorithms. Um, I guess somebody could write a proposal for that. Don't do it yet though, because we don't you know know that we know what it should look like yet. But eventually in the future we'd need that. All right, another hand, right there. Uh, that's not the, 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 the NVCC's, which is one of our two compilers, compilation model is a, uh, uh, a two-phase um, uh, model, but it doesn't compile code in the server. It, it just it does it wherever you're compiling. Our other compiler, NVC++, has a unified compilation model where it, it builds a single AST and it only does a split late in the code, but I, I don't, I'm not sure that that's strictly on topic here, so let's follow up on that one uh, later. Yeah, over there on the left. I don't know what Zig is or how Zig works, so the answer is no. I, I, do, I have not considered the way that Zig did. Um, so that Zig does it is how Circle does it. Yeah, but but Sean now like tells me that like the way that Circle does reflection, he's not a huge fan of. So I, I no, I haven't considered it. I've considered the 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 thing that the committee is. is I've considered the thing that the committee has said that this is what we want to do. Um, I don't have a particular like horse in this race, but that's the thing that they seem to be going in. And it doesn't seem awful to me. Sankle. Yeah. The compiler having being too powerful at compile time, it could like you know go to web and download something potentially, um, and that fear is what what why the circle style metaprogramming got rejected, and that rejection itself is is the primary reason why Sean doesn't want to mess with it anymore because he's too scared that people are going to like the compiler because it got rejected so bad. Yeah. I I. I so there's like history there. It's like I think the circle metaprogramming model is clearly superior. To yeah. The I, I, I'll amend my answer to say that, yeah, I agree with David. I, I, if I had to pick a horse, I would probably go with the circle style thing. Um, but in terms of things that are like models that the committee might actually pursue at this point, like this is the one that, uh, that seems the most practical to me. Um, like, yeah, I would prefer the circle model. Um, but I don't think that that's one of the options that we have on the table unless, you know, circle, unless we just like close the C++ committee and just appoint Sean, dictator of C++. I don't know, that wouldn't be a bad idea. All right, another question. Uh, yeah, I'll take another one from you. Because we, as a committee, are a collection of 300 independent authors, each doing their own thing, and we lack centralized direction and purpose, and have limited ability to prioritize. All right, next question. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to slide 142? Uh, probably. It's pretty close to where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, how can you uh, slot it so that you avoid post sharing? Uh, you can't, but I'm unconcerned about that here. Okay. Yeah. Like it's okay. It's 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 one write from each thread. Um, like it's not, you know, eh. It's okay. It's one write from each thread and it's at the end of a parallel section when at when you're going back to a single threaded operation. So I really don't care about the performance that much at that point. Okay. But like you could 
you know, you could appropriately align the, you know, the vector, um, the partials vector to avoid the false sharing. Great question. Never gotten that one. I've, given, I've gone through this example like a dozen times. You were paying attention, sir. All right, we, I'll keep taking questions until they kick me out of here. Um, is this your first time? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So like That's my understanding. So what would happen if uh, the pattern doesn't match? Um, David, what happens if the pattern doesn't match? <laughs> if you have an, if you do like return inspect, because inspect's an expression, right? Mm -hmm. well, if you do return inspect and the pattern doesn't match, what happens? What generally what happens if the pattern? It has to have a default. Uh, it has to have a default? Okay, so it has to. It, 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 you get a compilation error if you if it if it if that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, cool. How do we, how does like how, is that a tractable problem for the compiler to diagnose? Yes. <laughs> are you are you sure? What what if, what if, what if I've wait, wait wait what if I've written some extractor which like the instance of which is in a different um, translation unit and the compiler can't see it, so it doesn't really know what it does. Extractors are, by definition, refutable patterns. Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to talk more about that later because I'm not sure I believe you, but we don't need to do it now. All right, more questions. I saw some more ends. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I wanted to ask you whether the ability to like, reflect identifier will be possible. Like, oh, do you think there is a benefit to reflecting identifier in local? Yeah, I mean, you, you'd, you'd be able to, because you're going to reflect on a variable and, and you'd be able to get the name on it. Is it useful? I mean, uh, pro probably. Will it be abused in some way? Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely think that's a useful thing. All right, other questions? I just got a yell. Okay, go. Um, that is really, look, look, the, the, la the last library evolution chair tried to convince the committee to break the API, and it was so scarring for him that he decided to go do other things. So I think I'm going to not take on that particular pursuit. Uh, yeah. A little bit louder. Could I envision a way of taking a meta class and converting it to a concept? Um, well, I don't really know how meta classes would work. Um, I definitely don't think that they're going to become a thing. We haven't heard anything about them in like three or four years, so um, I wouldn't be expecting that to happen. Um, I suppose probably. Why, why do you? I'm going to do my, my my classic thing. Why are you asking that question? <laughs> Um, I, I think that there might be, but again, I don't think that the committee's, like, w w meta classes was a proposal that we saw once on the committee, as far as I'm aware. And we saw it once in an evening session, and there was some feedback, there were no votes taken, and there was some positive feedback, there was some negative feedback, and that was in, like, 2017, 2018, and I haven't heard anything about it since. So, I don't think that it's a thing that's happening. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. All right, other questions? This is your last chance. I'm going to get off stage otherwise. Still got some time, so yeah. Right. Maybe a bit of a not necessarily related question, but. Uh, yeah, we can do off topic questions at this point, no, yeah. It's like it's a bit off topic. You said you uh, saw that they include this uh, scan. Yeah. And you said that like, with one uh, small change, it will run on the GPU. Yeah. Not really. A, a, GP, a GPU is, so a CPU is a latency optimized general purpose processor. A modern GPU is a bandwidth optimized general purpose processor. You can run all of C++ on your GPU. We, have, we haven't implemented uh, like exceptions 
yet. We're working on coroutines. If you really desperately want exceptions on your GPU, there's nothing that stops us from doing it. But uh, a GPU can do everything that a CPU can do. Some of the things that it does might be a lot slower. You might not want to do them there. Um, because again, it's a bandwidth optimized processor, not a latency optimized processor. But modern GPUs are not the thing from 10 years ago that were incredibly limited in their capabilities. Modern GPUs are general purpose processors that can execute essentially any code. So like you mean you can compile this whole program for the GPU? Versus mm -hmm. like compile a program for my CPU that will generate a program for the GPU? Um, well, we, we, sure, you could compile and run you know, your entire program on, on the GPU if, if you wanted to. Um, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't run main on, on the GPU. Um, in, it, it needs to have a, a CPU process that is associated with it. Um, I mean, in today's model, but there's no, there's no fundamental reason that we, we couldn't build it to work that way. Um, the, the way that I, I feel like there may be uh, some uh, confusion about the, the compilation model here. When we compile a C++ program that's going to run heterogeneously, we build, like in the NVC++ compiler, we build up a single AST, we lower it down to some IR, we do some optimization, some transformations, then like late in the, in the compilation stage, we split out to two different machine code generators, we do some more optimizations, and we generate machine code for the CPU, machine code for the GPU. And then we put those all into one binary together. It's all statically compiled code. I mean, there's this, for, for all intents and purposes here, it's all statically compiled code. And then when you start executing your, your program, some of that code runs on the CPU. And then at some point, you do something that causes some of that code to start running on the GPU. And that loads in and runs from the, the part of the binary that's the GPU compiled code. Um, some functions are compiled in both the CPU and the GPU part of the code. Some functions are only compiled in one of the two because they're only needed in one of the two. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, um, right there. Yeah, yeah, getting the schedule. That's a good question. So we're, there's definitely going to be a plan to have a default system scheduler. Um, uh, on our implementation, there will be a switch that will make the system scheduler be the GPU, or probably more likely on our implementation, there will be a switch that will make it not be the GPU scheduler. Um, so on, on our implementation, there will probably be a switch that will make it not be, not, that'll make the system default scheduler, uh, you know, either be the GPU scheduler or the CPU scheduler. Um, whether there will be a sp explicitly named, you know, GPU scheduler uh, uh, thing in the standard library, I mean, we could probably add that. It would be, you know, it, it would be implementation defined whether it's there or not and like what it does. Um, it probably wouldn't be called GPU scheduler. Probably it would be called something like, you know, bandwidth, you know, optimized scheduler versus like latency optimized scheduler, some very generic name um, to like let implementations have freedom in what it does. But yeah, I think we'll probably have some name for that. At, at, probably maybe not at first, but um, uh, I think that at some point we will we will certainly have that. Um, I'm not sure that 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 the utility of that is um, going to be uh, super like important because. I don't think it's going to be that painful for you to just use, you know, a systems like our, our implementation will ship a GPU scheduler that just may not be, you know, the standard one, and that it'll be pretty easy to just plug that in. And the the portable, the fact that changing schedulers is not going to be a big onerous thing; it's going to be a thing you do in one place. Um, yeah. All right. I saw some other hands here. All right, there. Let's assume that let's assume that name of um, does not give you uh, like I, I don't know exactly how the, it works in the actual proposal, but let's assume that like name of just gives you like the local name of the function. I'm, I suspect that like part of the whole reflection thing is that it probably gives you a way to like crawl up and figure out what namespace it lives in and and figure out all those things. Um, I don't know exactly how that would work, but I'm pretty sure that like you ask name of on a on a particular entity, it's going to give you what its local name is. I don't know, Hannah's here. She's the chair of the Reflection Study Group. Ask her about that. Uh, next, uh, next question. Yeah. Um, as I can ask unrelated questions, um, will there be a C++ multi-module uh, build system, the standard, maybe, 
Uh, standard build system, I think that's pretty unlikely. I mean, there's CMake, it's the de facto standard build system. I gave a talk about that a few years ago. They're working on it. They're working on it, yeah. I, I see them every now and then and poke them about it, yeah. Uh, yeah, right there. I think the committee is very interested in standardizing reflection. I think the problem with both the problem with reflection is that we currently don't have a lot of people who are like driving it. Um, some of the main people who had been driving it um, are doing different work now, um, and so there haven't been uh, that many updates to the sort of the core proposal. Like basically, the committee voted and said, "Hey, this is the direction we want to go in," and that was like a year or two ago, and I haven't heard much since then. Um, the reflection study group's meeting next week at Varna, so maybe things will happen. Um, I think pattern matching, there's been more activity on it. Um, uh, there's been a lot of des design discussion about it, and um, it's actually not entirely clear to me what exactly the status of it is right now, and whether or not the person who is the, 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 the main champions are still uh, like working on it. Like David was one of the people who had been working on it, but he's working on other stuff now, and one of the main things that um, uh, limits features from getting is not the committee's interest in it, but whether we have good champions to, uh, to work on it. Um, uh, senders is the thing that um, we, uh, senders is the one thing out of these three where we, had, we have a, like a, a team that's actively working on it, um, and that gives me the highest confidence out of these three features that it will make it into 26. For reflection, yeah. For pattern matching, um, I think the basic shape of inspect, yes. But there's a lot of th this whole qu there's this, a lot of question about like how patterns will work and it, about things like convertibility. And there was this proposal for this is as syntax. So I think there's a lot of um, I, I, I the form of of what I showed you for pattern matching. Um, I believe that there are subsequent updates that aren't fully captured by the paper. Um, I think the basic shape is um, more or less uh, 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 correct, but there, there may be you know, changes in the future. Um, the, the nods from David indicate to me that perhaps the alternative designs are a little bit, um, uh, were not enthusiastically received by the committee. Okay, all right, I'm gonna take one more question and um, we're gonna be done here. Um, well, there's two more hands, so I'll take you, both of you, go ahead. Um, it's in the paper, but I think there's a separate paper that, like the reflection paper uses it and references it, but I do believe that there's a separate paper. The thing where you can do it at class scope is entirely an invention of Andres and I that, that has not been proposed at any point in time on, by the committee. It's just a thing that we thought was useful um, that's similar to what's in D. Um, all right, the hand back up there, yeah. I would assume that it will be Turing compliant. I mean, if it, yeah, you can if you have the template for it, you can you know, do all the other things. So yeah, let's assume that it's going to be Turing complete because we need a, another Turing complete facility in the language. All right, I think we're going to call it there. Thank you all for your time. You call, come find me later.